Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. It's the summer, but we're gonna keep on doing the teaching, and I'd love to talk to you today about Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, which is the Hobby Lobby case, which just came out today. So we're gonna break it down, we're gonna look at the constitutional issues, we're gonna present both sides, cause I'm Johnny Cash today, baby, and then you can leave it down in the comments below. So giddy up for the learning, here we go. Blame it on peyote. That's right, folks. The drug, the cactus juice that gives you hallucinations, peyote. This actually stems, if you go way back into the late 80s, of a case called Employment Division versus Smith, which stemmed from an Oregon law that basically said you couldn't work for the state if you had uh, you know, drugs in your system, like peyote. And uh, Smith was a Native American. He was actually in the Native American church, which is a Christian Native American church, where they took peyote as a sacrament. And the Supreme Court decided that um, the religious liberty of Smith could be overridden by the compelling interest of the state, that, namely that they didn't want um, you know, people working for them on drugs. So because of that court case, there was a lot of religious liberty folks and people on the left, like people in the ACLU, who did dig that. They were like, you know, we're not down with that. So they lobbied, they pressured Congress, and they got Bill Clinton to support a law called the uh, Religious Freedom Restor Restoration Act. Um, this would be 1993. And uh, it had wide bipartisan support. I believe it was uh, 97 to 3 in the Senate, unanimous in the House. Bill Clinton, a Democratic, signed the bill. And, and basically the bill uh, created a strict scrutiny test um, for all religious free expression um, court cases. In a sense, they were trying to make it harder for Oregon um, to interfere with Smith's sacrament of using peyote. They wanted to carve out a religious exemption to a law. So we're getting closer now to talking about Obamacare and uh, what happened today in the news. So basically the law says this. They said, look, if the government's going to pass some type of legislation which interferes with what you see as a person's, and that's going to be important, you know, the free exercise of their religion, then two things have to occur. If you're going to do that, if you're going to take away someone's liberty, number one, you have to have a really, like, a compelling interest. We have to look at it strictly, in a sense, the same way we would look at it if you were treating black and white people differently. You'd look at a law like that, you go, ah, I don't know about that. And the same thing would hold true for uh, laws that are going to get in the way of the free exercise of religion. And number two, you have to show that this is the pathway there. There isn't other pathways you could try. That this is like the last resort in order to achieve your compelling interest. Now that we understand the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, we can take a look at Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. So Burwell is the Secretary of Health and Human Services. She's, in a sense, the one that is the enforcer of uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. And part of the Affordable Care Act has an interest in focusing on women's health reproductive care. They have an interest in lowering the abortion rate in their eyes. They have an interest in making sure that birth control is um, affordable and accessible to all women who have health insurance. So they're going to mandate that in Obamacare, in the Affordable Care Act, that if you have a business, more than 50 people, and you have to provide coverage now, and you know private health insurance actually provide that coverage, that you have to have birth control covered. So enter Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is now going to enter standing on the idea that this is violating the free exercise clause in conjunction with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. They're claiming as a corporation that we're a persons and that by making um, us have to cover through payments to the insurance company who forth then covers the woman, some type of birth control, like say the morning after pill, which we consider abortion, in a sense you're making me a culprit um, in violating my religious tenements. So therefore, I should be able to um, not have to follow that mandate, that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act covers me against this government intrusion into my religious liberty. So two questions the court has to answer. Number one, does Hobby Lobby have standing? Um, is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act talking about Hobby Lobby, a for-profit corporation? And number two, has the government proved that there's a compelling interest and there's no other pathway in order to achieve that compelling interest 
of giving women um, affordable access to reproductive health care. And what the court decides is number one, and this is a 5-4 decision. So this is five, the conservative majority now, which would be, if we rattle them off really quickly, we have Kennedy, we have Alito, we have Scalia, we have Thomas, we have Roberts, and then we have the three women in Breyer, and that would be Ginsburg and Kagan and Sotomayor and Stephen Breyer. That's the more progressive and liberal wing. So what the five majority says, and Alito wrote the majority decision, is that, look, if nonprofit corporations are covered by this, and they are, say the Catholic Church comes in or something like that, that's a corporation in a sense. They don't make money, but they're, you know, a volunteer organization. They're covered by the law. So why don't we also expand this to, and here's the language that the right uses, to closely held family corporations. So if the corporation um, is a family-run corporation, it's closely held, that's the language that you need to be able to interpret, then they can claim status under this law. They can be, in a sense, the person that's claiming free exercise thereof. So therefore, Hobby Lobby qualifies. And then number two, they say that even though the Obama administration might have a compelling interest, there might be a compelling interest in making sure that women have affordable access to reproductive care. They give that. But is this the only pathway there? No, it's not. There's other ways than to have to violate the religious liberty of Hobby Lobby in order to achieve that outcome. So therefore, no. So does this knock down Obamacare? Absolutely not. Um, does this dismantle the health care program? No. All it does is it says in terms of the mandate, that's going to go forth. The mandate goes forth. We're still going to mandate that uh, companies like IBM, who have health insurance programs for their employees, have to have reproductive care in them. But if you want an exemption and you fall under this religious exemption of a closely held you know, family corporation, then you can have that exemption. Now here's the dissent. The dissent comes from Ginsburg, and it's pretty hardcore. There's actually a great video on YouTube if you want to watch it. You can click that right there. I think the guy's name is Michael Mann. Maybe I messed that up, but click it and you'll laugh a little bit as he wrote a song about uh, the Ginsburg dissent. But Ginsburg says a few things. She says, number one, that uh, this is ludicrous that this corporation is a religious entity and has religious rights, like a person would. They said if it was a religious entity or organization, it would attract like-minded religious people, and it doesn't, and it attracts employees that have lots of different belief systems. And then number two, she says that if you're going to allow for this, if you're going to have an exemption for you know, the family-held corporation that's against uh, family planning or something like that, then what if it's a Scientologist who doesn't believe in pharmaceutical coverage? Or what if it's a Muslim who objects to pills that are you know, covered with gelatin because they're you know, against that? Or what if it's, uh, you know, insert your religious belief? Are we going to be able to cover all of those? Because if you don't, then you're violating the flip side of the First Amendment, which is the Establishment Clause. If the government's saying that Hobby Lobby can have the exemption, but the you know, Muslim corporation can't because of the gelatin objections, then they're, in a sense, picking one religion over the other. And then Ginsburg goes on to say that, you know, in terms of financials, um, a woman who's working minimum wage would have to work a full month in order to afford an IUD if she didn't have that covered in her health care plan. So she says this has a very real impact on poor women. And basically she finishes up by saying that the court has entered really a minefield here and what's next, who but, you know, nobody knows. But there's basically the decision. It's a decision that if you're a libertarian, you can stand maybe on the idea of religious liberty and this expands liberty um, for people that want to practice the religion, not just in a church, but in the public square. And if you're on the flip side of that, you might see this an intrusion into your religious liberty. But whatever you think, good for you, that's grand. Leave it down in the comments below where you should be battling it out because that's where it goes. I hope I did a good job being your Johnny Cash for today. But uh, right now, we're going to have to say goodbye. Make sure you remember, guys, where attention goes, energy flows. And if you haven't checked it out, Saturday nights on H2, the United Stuff of America, where you might see this ugly mug talking a little bit about the history on the boot dupes. All right, there you go, guys. We'll see you next time. Bang, bang, bang.